The encounter with Christ changes everything. The problem, especially with our young people today, is that they have never truly encountered Christ. They know things about Jesus, but they don't know Jesus deeply, personally, and intimately. Here are the top three reasons why I think young people are leaving the church. These are the major challenges faced by them today. Number one, and I hear this all the time. I've been to 31 countries preaching about the, the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith. And what kids tell me, they want to hear the truth and they're not hearing it all the time. And His Excellency nailed it last night when he said that we are not answering their questions. I was in Papua New Guinea on speaking tour in July, and I spoke to over 2,000 youth at, uh, while I was there for three days. One of the days was a youth event. I spoke to over 2,000 youth. And during the Q&A session, even the organizers were shocked at the depth of the questions these young people were asking me. They are thinking deeply and seriously about what's happening in the world around them, and we're not giving them answers. We're placating them. We're not giving them the truth that sets them free to become the person who God created them to be. Second, there's a serious disconnect between their faith and their everyday life. Many of them go to Mass and say, Mass is boring. Why? They don't know why they're there. <laughs> they're there because mommy and daddy drag them there every week. And then when they go off to college... These professors with all these fancy letters after their name fill their heads with garbage. And, and by the way, higher institutions these days, they are programming young people. They don't teach young people how to think. They teach them what to think. And they come back to your house and well, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. What is the disconnect? They, they look at Mass, what, what does any of that stuff happening at that altar up there has to do with me, has to do with my life every day? But yet, in their heart of hearts, that's exactly what they want, what Jesus is giving them in word and sacrament, and I'll prove it to you. Now, I am not a big television watcher. In fact, I call television the idiot box because it makes people stupid. But during the, pan <laughs> during the pandemic, when I couldn't travel, I usually do about 250,000 miles a year. I couldn't travel very much, so I said, let me watch a little more TV. Let me see what the big deal is. So I'm flipping through the channels, and I'm seeing all these shows about vampires and zombies. And I'm looking, I'm looking at the channel, Walking Dead, Waking Dead, Last of Us, all these different shows about zombies. Then the vampires, uh, Twilight, right? Low light, traffic light, stop light, whatever. I look, I, 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 why is this culture so obsessed with these malevolent creatures of folklore and legend? Then it hit me. What do vampires and zombies have in common? They're dead, but yet they're alive. Huh? Now, what's a vampire that's dead have to do to stay alive? Drink blood. What's a zombie that's dead have to do to stay alive? alive. Eat flesh. See, what young people are craving are flesh and blood. But because they don't know what's happening in the holy sacrifice of the mass, because they don't know who's in the tabernacle, because they don't know who's in that monstrous and Eucharistic adoration, they're trying to find flesh and blood in creatures that are dead. That can't give them anything except take their money. When for free, and why is it free? He already paid the price. They could come to the altar of the living God and receive the true flesh and blood of Jesus Christ that will give them life forever. Vampires and zombies make believe. What happens at the altar at every mass is the really real. Finally, and probably worst of all, young people have no idea how much God loves them. No clue. I spoke in an event before the pandemic in Sydney, Australia, 
It was for the Archdiocese of Sydney, a middle school event. There were 700 middle schoolers there. And during that talk, I told them, you have no idea how much God loves you. When I got off the stage, there was a young priest at the bottom of the stairs waiting for me. He goes, Deacon, let me drive home the point you just made. He said he was only ordained for three years. He said when I was first ordained, they put me into high school because they figured, you know, teach religion. They figured young priests, newly ordained, they may get some vocations out of this thing. And so as an experiment one day, he wrote on the, well, I still call it the blackboard, <laughs> but he, they use all that digital stuff now. He put, I believe in God on one side, and I don't believe in God on the other side. And he asked the young people to stand under the statement that best represented what they believed. So he said, maybe 90, a little over 90% of the kids got up and stood under the statement, I believe in God. And the others stood under, you know, probably atheists or kids that are just there for an education, stood under, I don't believe in God, and sat down. Then he wrote, God loves me, God doesn't love me, and asked them to do the same thing. Stand under the statement that best represented what they believed. Father said, none of the kids stood under the statement that said God loves me. Not one. He said a handful stood under the statement that said God doesn't love me, but most just sat there because they weren't sure. How could they not be sure that God loves them? How could they not be sure that God is inviting them into a relationship of intimate, personal, loving, and life-giving communion. That's the problem. I, and I'll, I'll just say this. Um, you know, I think sometimes our emphasis is a little bit wrong uh, today. I mean, we're talking about important things. Mother Earth, immigrants, migrants. I'm an immigrant to this country. I became a citizen at 17 years old. So I, I get it. But here's, and those are important issues, but here's the thing. Kids aren't leaving the church over the earth, migrants, and immigrants. They're leaving the church because they don't know Jesus. And that's where our emphasis, evangelization, the encounter, with, the life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. So, where do we start? The problem that we, that we have for evangelization is this. We think we can change people's minds and hearts, and we can't. We're not that good. Only God, the Holy Spirit, can do that. So the first thing you typically hear is meet people where they are. What does that mean? Meet people where they are. All right? So let me give you an example. I was speaking at an event in Portland where I live, Portland, Oregon. Land of the fruits and the nuts, by the way. <laughs> Especially now since the pandemic. Woo! <laughs> I was speaking at the Lucky Labrador Pub. This was uh, a, the a theology on tap, and it was a regular pub, but they had this kind of cynical, this upper room, and in that if they fit about 60 to 70 people, and that's where theology on tap was being held. And because we were at capacity, they assigned a bartender to the event. So during the talk, I asked a rhetorical question. How many of you would give your kids drugs and alcohol? Of course, nobody said anything except the bartender. I would! I said, I'm going to have to talk to you when we're done. So I finished the talk, and I, work, I was still working full time. I worked all day. I, I went and did the gig, and now I'm packing up to go home, and the bartender comes over to me. I thought we were going to talk. Oh. So I sit down with the guy. I said, look, what parent in their right mind would ever give their kids drugs and alcohol. He said, it's like when I do the shrooms, man. So now I'm saying to myself, not only do I not want to be talking to this guy right now, I am now talking to Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. <laughs> I said, you ingest hallucinogenic mushrooms? He said, yeah, man, there's like this energy and this force of the universe. And we have to connect and be one with the universe. And so I, 
I drive out into a beautiful place and I walk into the woods and I eat these mushrooms and I get high, man. <laughs> and when I get high, I feel uh, at one with the rocks and the trees and the universe. So I'm, I'm thinking, what do I say to this guy right now? And, and so when he finished, I said, let me, let me see if I hear what you're saying. You believe that there's something that's out there beyond yourself. You call it energy or force. And you feel a need to connect with this force of the universe. And the way you do that is you drive to a beautiful place. And when you get there, you eat these mushrooms and get high. And in that euphoria, you feel connected to everything around you and to the God, I mean, and, and to the universe. He's like, yeah, man. I said, you know what? I can totally appreciate where you're coming from. Let me tell you how we do it as Catholics. We also believe that there is a force of the universe. We call him God. And we also feel this desire and this need to connect with the God of the universe. And the way we do that, we also drive to a beautiful place. It's called church. And in that beautiful place, we don't eat mushrooms and get high, but we consume what we call the Eucharist, which we believe to be the body, blood, soul, and divinity of the God of the universe. And when we consume that Eucharist, we're one with all the people worshiping with us, we're one with nature, and we're one with God. He was like, yeah, man. And I was like, yeah, man. And then I left before he could ask me anything else, right? But, <laughs> but that was the point. My job was not to try to convert him. My job was to meet him in his lived experience and open a door to be able to listen to God. Sometimes that's where we need to start with people. But we think, oh, I have to, all this apologetics and I have to hammer them with St. Thomas Aquinas and all this. No, no. See, here's the thing. How does this work? Jesus gives us the model of how to do this. Now, there's many programs out there for evangelization, and they're all wonderful, but sometimes I think we program people to death. What we, the, the program actually is just Jesus, the parable of the sower. We heard the gospel not too long ago. Some was out there throwing seeds, some seeds land on rocky soil, some on thorny soil, some of the birds come and eat it, the weeds come and choke it, some land on good soil. Where the seed lands, not our problem. Our job, because when that seed of faith lands, what does St. Paul say? I seeded, Apollo swartered, God gave the yield. So our job is to be faithful and throw the seeds, because when that seed of faith lands on that rocky, stony, weed-filled heart, it is, yeah, we, we may throw a little water on it, but it's God that gives it sunlight and fertilizer and allows that seed of faith to grow in that person's heart. We can't do that. Only God can do that. So here is the whole key to evangelization. When you're living what I call Eucharistically, you're living a Eucharistic faith in the world, taking what we receive in word and in sacrament, and taking that out of the church at the end of Mass and becoming Eucharist to the world, witnessing to the power of God's love, to this, as Jesus says, this adulterous and sinful generation that needs a witness. When we do that, we will recognize opportunities to evangelize, to throw seeds of faith. And what happens, we recognize those opportunities. Maybe the door will just be open just a little bit. And when that crack opens in the door, we recognize what God is doing. Our job is to stick our foot in that door, throw some seeds, and get out! Get out of the Holy Spirit's way and let God be God. Let me give you an example. When I first moved to Oregon, I was working for the, a, a very large school district. And it was an hour drive from my house to the school district office. I worked, I was in charge of police services and I worked in the risk management department. 
So it was myself, the risk manager, fire and life safety, environmental health and safety, these four large cubicles. Now, the guy that was the risk manager was a fallen away Catholic. But the thing is, he, he wasn't even a Christmas and Easter Catholic. He only went to funerals. I, I don't know what you call that, deadbeat Catholic? I'm not sure what, he, what you call But he, he's, call, he's what I call a natural law kind of guy, right? Very personable. And I was in graduate school at the time, and I had just written a paper on marriage and family life, which I thought was very good. So uh, I come into work one day, and I, he must have had a blowout fight with his wife the night before. He was cursing her up one side and down the other. It hurt my heart to hear him talking about his wife like that. But you know what I heard? <laughs> Door open. Time to throw some seeds. So I came in the next day with my paper, and I did this. <sighs> oh, man. Oh, man, these guys trying to kill us. And ooh, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to fail. They're going to throw me out. I just, oh, I don't know what I'm He saw me pacing. He comes over to me and goes, hey, you okay? I, well, you know I'm studying to be a deacon, man, and. You know, they, they're giving us all this work to do, all these papers. And, you know, this paper is such a huge part of my grade. I was up all night working on it. I don't know if it's any good. I'm probably going to fail. They're going to throw me out of the program. I don't know what I'm going to do. He said, would you let me take a look at it? Would you? <laughs> so he takes the paper. I go back to my cube. Right before lunch, he comes back with the paper. I said, oh, thank you so much. I can't tell you what this means to me. I appreciate you. Did I mess this thing up? He asked one question. I answered it. I never brought it up again. Seed thrown, get out. A year later, I left that job and started, uh, became the chief, police chief at the University of Portland. A year after that, the governor named me to the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training, which oversees training for all the police officers for the state of Oregon, which requires a Senate confirmation hearing. So I drive back down there. I go to the confirmation hearing. I say, hey, wait a minute. My old office is right up the street. Let me go say hi to my old workmates. So I go into the office. They're like, hey, you're back. Hey, you're back. This guy stands up. He goes, what are you doing here? I'm like, dang. Good to see you too, bro, you know. He said, I was just about to call you. Now, I had not heard from this guy for two years. I said, he goes, you have time to talk? I said, sure. So we sat down. He goes, my wife has cancer. He said, I know you are a man of prayer. He said, you know, they took one breast. We don't know if we could save the other one, but would you please pray for my wife? I said, let me tell you something right now. I'm going to pray for your wife. My family's going to pray for your wife and you and your family. I got the church. I'm going to call some monks and nuns. Everybody going to be praying. I said, is there anything else I can do for you? He said, well, actually, remember that paper that you wrote? And I had to think for a second because it's been two years. Paper? Oh, right. He said, can we talk some more about that? See, here's the thing. We think we serve a fast food God, right? If I'm hungry, I could go down to the restaurant, I'd be eating in two minutes. We don't serve that kind of God. God works in his time, and God's timing is always perfect. It's not our time. When that seed is thrown, it's going to take time for God to, to, for them to open themselves to receive what God is doing in their lives and for that seed to start to sprout. It takes time. Time, we have to be patient. It's another one from that same office. The young lady who supported, the, the admin, who supported the four of us, lovely young lady in her mid-20s. She was baptized Catholic. Nothing else after that. No first reconciliation, no first communion, no mass, nothing. They, just, they probably figured, well, we got one. Let's dunk her. Poop, and that's it. No formation. But 
she knew me. So one day, being a gentleman, it was winter time, and it gets dark pretty early in Oregon during the winter, walking her to her car, we pass my car. My car is parked under the uh, parking lot lamp, and in there is, in the front one is my rosary hanging from the rearview mirror. Because I used to say the rosary on the way down to work or on the way back. She looks in the window, that's a rosary, right? Yeah. That's the thing with all the Hail Marys on it? Yeah, you want to see how it works? <laughs> so I reached into the car, and I grabbed the rosary, and I was showing it to her. And she said to me, why do you do that? You know what I heard? <laughs> now, look, look, look at her question. I could have said, well, let me tell you about the Battle of Lepanto and how the rosary saved Western civilization. Or let me tell you how the Blessed Mother gave the rosary to St. Dominic. That's not what she asked. She said, why do you do that? Personal question requires a personal answer. So I said, all I'm doing, or anybody do when they're praying the rosary, they're reflecting on the deepest mysteries of our faith, the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the heart of his blessed mother. So I said, for example, the joyful mysteries. The first one's the Annunciation. She goes, she goes, Annunciation, I said, that's when the angel came. Oh, when she's gonna have a baby. I said, yes, that. So when I'm praying that decade of the rosary and I'm meditating on that mystery, I'm saying, okay, here's this teenage girl. The angel comes there with an extraordinary message. Although I'm sure she didn't fully understand all the implications of her yes, she said, yes, I am the handmaid of the Lord. She trusted God completely with her life. So I'm saying, do I have that kind of trust in God? Am I, will, 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 when God calls me, am I willing to respond with as much love as she did? Right? And we walked through the, we don't walk through a few of the ministries, about 20 minutes or so, walked into a car, never brought it up again. Fast forward 11 years later. I left, I, I made an announcement that I was leaving my job uh, at the university. I was a police chief for 11 years now. I leave that job and I'm, I'm starting my speaking thing. And she wrote me a Facebook message. Not, not heard from this young lady for 11 years. She said, it's great to see you doing the things that you were meant to do. You are definitely a stepping stone on my path back to the church. I had no idea this young lady came back to the church at all. She said, your love of the church was always inspiring and thought-provoking. Your what? Not your vast biblical knowledge of languages, not your theology, your love. That's what she saw, and that's what she experienced in that evangelizing moment when she allowed Christ to enter into her life. She felt the power of God's love. It was always inspiring and thought-provoking. I still struggle at times, but I know where I'm going. God bless you. Okay, now, what happens if things get a little bit testy? What if someone's all up in your business and they get angry? You believe a piece of bread is God? You believe you have to go to a man to have your sins forgiven? Show me from the Bible where your mask comes from. And the first thing we want to do, we want to get defensive. We want to we take it personally. Don't take it personally at all. They're not mad at you. <laughs> They're mad because they don't understand. See, when someone yells at me, what I hear is, I'm hurting. Please help me. What I hear is, I'm lost. Please show me the way. That's what I hear. Now, I'm going to give you an example of what you do in a situation. And this is where apologetics comes in, right? So apologetics is a tool of evangelization. Apologia, uh, ap apologetics means to defend, right? So it's a defense of the faith, but it's not the same as evangelization, okay? So here's how you incorporate it. I was speaking in Sydney, Australia, an event that was packed, like 800 people in the church. The Maronite 
Archbishop Saidna, that's what they call their archbishops, was in the front row with his priests sitting next to him. And the place was packed, 800 people. During the talk, I was talking about the theology of femininity and how I thought the Catholic Church had the best theology of women of any faith. I'm not saying the other ones were bad. I just think we have the best. And I was giving some examples from Buddhism, Hinduism, and I got to Islam. Now, I've read the Quran. There is a, a surat in the Quran that says if you believe a woman did something wrong, you can strike her. You don't have to have evidence. You don't have to see it yourself. You just have to believe she did, and you can hit her. Now, when I said that, a Muslim gentleman stood up, and I know it was Muslim because they had a kufi on. He said, no, you misrepresent Islam. And everybody was like, whoa, and the bishop was like, what's going on back there? You know, and I'm like, okay, sir, hold on. I apologize. Just like I don't want anybody misinterpreting our faith, I don't want to misinterpret your faith. Can you please tell us what it says? He said, you need English. You must need Arabic. I said, you are correct. I, I, although the English translation that I read was considered the best English translation by all the imams, but you're right. I could do Latin and Greek and Hebrew, but I can't do Aramaic. Obviously, you do. Can you please tell us what it says? He said, you don't have to hit her that hard. And people started laughing just like you did, and he got angry. So now I'm saying to myself, I need to get control of this thing or else I'm going to lose the whole thing. I said, sir, look, I need to finish this talk. Let me do this. I'm going to ask you two questions right now. If you can answer these two questions for me, I will stop the talk, and I will continue to engage you. If you can't, then please sit down, and I promise you, I will talk to you for as long as you want afterward. He said, he nodded his head. I said, thank you. I appreciate that very much. And again, sir, I apologize for reading the Quran in English. But in the Quran, it says that Jesus, who is a much lesser prophet than Muhammad, Jesus does miracles. Muhammad does none. How could Muhammad be more powerful than Jesus when in your holy book, Jesus does miracles, Muhammad does zero, none. That's my first question. My second question is this. The only woman mentioned by name in the entire Quran is Miriam, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Muhammad's mother, nor any of his wives, including his favorite wives, Fatima and Khadijah, are not mentioned at all in your holy book. Only the mother of of Jesus. How can Muhammad be more powerful than Jesus when Jesus' mother is mentioned and Muhammad's mother or wives are not? And he sat down. Now, why did I tell you that? Not because of that, because of this. Several months later, I got an email, Facebook thing, from someone who was not there. This was a woman who had literally that same week just had a baby, or else she would have come. Here's what she wrote to me. Just like to let you know that when my daughter and husband went to a talk of yours in Sydney, they took a friend with them who was a non-practicing Muslim. That means that young man saw the interaction between me and the Muslim gentleman. After your talk, he bought 13 of your other talks, came home, downloaded them onto his phone, and has listened to them on his way to work and back. At the present moment, he is preparing to receive instruction in the Catholic faith. Praise the Lord and God bless you for coming and sharing your faith so powerfully in Australia. Now, what does that have to do with me? Nothing! We got to remember, in this evangelizing venture, what is our role? We are just instruments. God is the musician. And through word and sacrament, we can become finely tuned instruments in God's hands. So God can use us, even sinners though we are. We're all sinners in need of God's mercy. God can still use us for his glory. We are the instruments, God's the musician. Now, lastly here. What about your family members who are away from the church? 
Ooh, yes. I heard the groans in the crowd. Your son, your daughter, your in-laws, your parents, away from the, no matter what you do, you cannot get them to even listen to you. Why? Because they know you, you're close to them. And it breaks your heart that your grandbabies aren't baptized. And what, what are you saying to yourself? Uh, what happened? They went to Catholic school. They got confirmed. They were in youth group. They went to mass with us every Sunday. And now they don't believe in Jesus. And I tried to give them a, 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 a catechism. I tried to send them Scott Hahn. I tried to send them Bishop Barron. I tried to send them all this stuff. And nothing's working. Deacon, what do I do? I hear this from grandmas at every parish mission I've done. Here's what I said. I said, look, first of all, stop working so hard. See, here's the thing. I love Scott Hahn. I love me some Scott Hahn, just like everybody else, okay? I just did a video for Emmaus Academy on evangelization. I love Bishop Brown. I'm addicted to his videos, okay? I watch them all the time. So, but I said to this, to this grandma, I said, look, your child doesn't know who Jesus Christ is. He don't care who Scott Hahn is or Bishop Barron. He doesn't care because he doesn't, he doesn't know Jesus. You have to introduce your child to Jesus. So how do I do that? So just an example. Again, you could take this and, and, and apply it into your own life. I said, here's what you, I said, do you babysit your grandkids? Well, yes. Well, here's what you do. Next time your son calls you, your conversation may go like this. Uh, Mom, uh, Jenny and I, we need to have a date night on Friday. Can you and dad watch the kids? Son, your father and I would love to watch our precious, beautiful grandchildren. And I just want you to know, son, that when I was praying my rosary today and I was meditating on Genesis chapter 2, he put them in the garden to till and to keep it, to serve, protect, and defend. That you would, I pray that you would lead your family to heaven. Hang up! Don't say another word. Don't say goodbye. Just hang it up. A couple days later, your son will call back. Mom, I just want to make sure we're on for Friday. You know, we got dinner reservations. Nope, son, we're good. In fact, I talked to your dad, and he said that we can, wa we can watch the kids all night. You and Jenny can have the whole night to yourself. Oh, Mom, that's awesome. Yes, sir, let me tell you what else is awesome. After Mass today... When I was meditating on St. Joseph, I prayed that you would be like St. Joseph and lead your family to heaven. Hang up! <laughs> now, at this point, your son is saying, what's wrong with mom, right? <laughs> then Friday shows up. They drop the kids off. You take the baby. Oh, son says, mom, this means a lot to us. We appreciate this. Son, no problem. I just want to let you know, when I was in adoration this afternoon, I was meditating on Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know what, son? He showed his life, he showed his love for the church by dying for her. And I pray that you would die to yourself to live for your family. Your son grabs you by the arm and pulls you over. Mom, why are you talking like that? What just happened? He is now coming to you. You have his attention. What do you do now? Wait a minute, son. Let me go get the catechism and read you paragraph 1685. <laughs> no. You tell your child about your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Son, you know what? When you were growing up, your dad and I, we made a lot of mistakes. Maybe we weren't always the best example. Sometimes we chose your sports over mass and you know, sometimes we didn't go to Mass every week, you know. But, but son, let me tell you what Christ has done in my life since I started praying a rosary every day, son. Son, let me tell you how your relationship with your father and I has, has, has gone through astronomical heights since we started praying together every day. Son... Let me tell you what God has done in my heart and my life since I started going to Eucharistic adoration 
for an hour a week. Because that's what your child needs to hear. That all that Catholic stuff actually means something in his life every day. That's what they need to hear. To reconnect their faith to their everyday lived experience. I give you, so let me give you some tips. Let me give you some tips. Here's six things you can do. Now, I saw in the, uh, the, the packets that they gave everybody, those little bags, that there was a pad and a pen. Or you, like me, that's what I use. I'm old school. Some of you younger guys, you know, your phones with your notes and all that stuff. Here's six things that you can do to help. Ev- now, again, this is not a panacea. Deacon said, if I do these six things, they're going to become Catholic again. Okay? <laughs> hmm? God works in his time, right? But here it is. Number one, don't argue with them. They already know how you feel. Because why do I say that? We're, come on. We're coming up to the time right now, Thanksgiving, Christmas, holiday season, where they're going to be coming to your house, and everything's going to be cool until somebody starts talking about religion or politics. Then, woo, crash and burn. They already know how you feel. Whenever they come and visit you or you visit them, you don't, you don't need to keep hammering them over and over again about why they should be going to church, about, you know, your eternal salvation is at stake. They know all that already. Don't argue with them. Why? Because that leads directly to number two. Love them more than ever before. I talk to young people who are away from the church. And one of the things they tell me is that they believe their parents don't love them as much anymore. I'm not saying that's true. That's how they feel. They feel because we're not practicing our faith the way our parents want us to, they don't love us as much anymore. So we need to love them more than ever before. Let me explain the Catholic principle here. We love everyone, but we always don't love their actions. And we judge actions we never judge people, all right? We love everyone, we always don't love their actions, we judge actions, we never judge people. So for example, my son is a chef. If my son took a big old chef knife and stabbed somebody, he's going to jail. I cannot accept what he did, what he did was wrong, but I will still love my son unconditionally, see? So if your kids aren't, you still love them unconditionally even though you don't approve of their lifestyle choice decisions. So when they're at your house and you, are, you get to an argument, when they leave, if that keeps happening, here's what's going to happen. Your, your son-in-law is going to say to your daughter, "Hun, you know, I love mom and dad, I really do, but... Every time we go over there, all they want to do is keep talking about the faith, the faith, how we're going to hell and all this stuff. And look, uh, you know, if that keeps happening, I don't want to go over there anymore. What do you think your daughter's going to do? What does the scripture say? Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his parents, cleaves to his wife, and they become one. Your children are not one with you. They're one with their spouse. And they will always choose their spouse over you. The last thing, no matter what happened in that house that day, whether it was good or argument, the last thing they need to hear when they walk out that door, I love you and I'm praying for you. No matter what else happened, I love you and I'm praying for you. That's what they leave with. Hmm? Third, everybody prays for their children, but we don't fast. Prayer and fasting. We're awesome as Catholics at prayer, but we're horrible at fasting. Think about this for a second. Our big penitential season is what? Lent. How many fasting days are in Lent? Two? Seven? Okay. Okay. One, remember, Good Friday is not in Lent. 
Lent ends with the start of the Mass of the Lord's Supper on Holy Thursday, which starts the shortest church season of the year, which is the Triduum. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. Fridays are abstinence days, not fasting days. The only fasting day is Ash Wednesday. One. Our Muslim brothers and sisters, Ramadan, they fast for 30 days every single day. Remember? The, 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 the disciples were trying to cast out the demon out that young man. They couldn't do it. Jesus comes, throw the demon out, and said, why couldn't we do it? He said, some demons can only be cast out by prayer and fasting. Huh? See, here's the thing. Fasting is cool. You know, I fast every Friday. Like when I got here on the flight, I didn't eat all day. The only meal I ate was the dinner last night. That's, that's my fast. I don't do it for me. I do it for my wife and my kids. But we can get creative. How about fasting for something you enjoy? Like, for example, football. I'm not going to watch my favorite football team for the next three weeks as a fast to unite with my prayer. And I'm looking at some of you who are like, I was with you, Deacon, until you said that. <laughs> but what are you willing to sacrifice for your children? Three weeks of football? See, here, here's a, why is fasting so powerful? When you're hungry, right, when your stomach is growling, or when you're not watching your TV, that, that physical angst that you feel, right, that, that hunger, that thirst, that longing, that desire is a physical reminder that what you're really hungering for, what you're really yearning for is a deep, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. When that desire is united with your prayer, lights out. Game over, lights out. Prayer and fasting. That's three. Don't argue with them. Love them more than ever before. Prayer and fasting. And show, number four, show the joy of the Lord. You know, I mean, Catholic. Are you a Catholic? Yes. Alleluia. Can't you see how happy I am to be Catholic? Thank you, Jesus. What is that? No, you know the best way to be joyful as Catholics? Stop watching political television and talk radio. Please. People like that, I, I cannot, I don't want to be around people like that because they're angry all the time. Show some joy, some passion about being, I'm not saying like be SpongeBob, you know, happy, happy, joy, joy. No, the, the, the joy that comes from knowing what Bishop Barron said last night, that the cross of Jesus Christ conquers all the tribulations and trials of this world. We should be joyful in that. You know how many times, like, forget, in, in my diocese, deacon, permanent deacons are not allowed to wear clerics except in limited cases. So I always dress in regular clothes, but I always wear my crucifix and miraculous medal everywhere, on the plane, off the plane, I don't care. I'm not embarrassed or ashamed of my faith. People come up to me and say, oh, I like your cross. Or how many times a flight attendants lean over, can you say a prayer for me? Yeah, I, I got you. Got you covered. Huh? It's a vehicle for evangelization. That joy, right, of, of being Catholic. Number five, study Catholic apologetics, which you should have no problem being part of Word on Fire. Right? Come on now. Some of the best resources along with the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. Uh, Number six, I'm going to put these together. Consecration to the Blessed Virgin Mary and Eucharistic Adoration. Oh, come on now. The best hour of my week is in Eucharistic Adoration. Now, why is Eucharistic Adoration so important? Think about it like this. Because you can pray anywhere. You can pray right here. You can pray in your house. You can pray in your car. What difference does adoration make being before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament? Now, I talked to my wife last night. And usually when I talk to her, I FaceTime so I can see her when I talk to her. But I'd rather be with her. Isn't it always better to be in the presence of the person that you love when you're talking to them? That's what adoration is. We are in the presence of the person that we say out of our mouth, Oh, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, you're the heart and the center of my life. But we don't want to spend any time with them. That hour a week just to be quiet. 
We are deathly afraid of silence in this culture today. Psalm 46, verse 11 says, be still and know that I, the word there in Hebrew is yalda, is knowledge that is gained by experience. In other words, be still and experience God in the stillness, in the silence, in the quiet. And let God speak to your heart. Just give him your complete gift of yourself in adoration. Uh, don't, yeah, you could pray a rosary or the office, and I do that many times, of course. But all God really wants is your heart. Lord, we, we got to work this out, Lord. Let's do this. And just talk to him. Eucharistic adoration completely changed the course and direction of my life. What's the connection with Mary? Mary was the first monstrance. She was the first vessel that held in the tabernacle of her womb the body, blood, soul, divinity of Jesus. When she went to see her kinswoman Elizabeth, that was the first Eucharistic procession. When she got to Elizabeth's house, when she greeted Elizabeth, John the Baptist leapt in Elizabeth's womb. And you know, some of you women out there are like, oh, I remember that. You know, and you say, oh, put your, oh, the baby's kicking. Oh, that's not what's going on here. The word they use for lept is skirtaal in Greek or Hebrew, dalak. It's the word they use for like mountain goat jumping off a mountain in Job or in the Psalms for an animal leaping. John the Baptist went nuts. Bah, 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 bah. Kick it up. Why? When the monstrous walked in, he began to adore. John the Baptist was the first adorer of our Lord in the monstrous of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Imagine what this world would be like if every man looked at a woman and saw the monstrance. If we really connected the Blessed Virgin Mary to Eucharistic adoration, there'd be nobody out of the church right now. Then finally, number, number well, I got a bonus one, number seven. <laughs> Pray that God brings someone else into their life besides you. <laughs> Pray that, I remember once, uh, a priest went to visit this guy, and this guy's son was away from the church, or the priest was talking to him, and um, uh, the, the, the guy, the priest was trying to raise some money or something like that, and the, the guy mentioned, he goes, he goes but his son, one, the priest went back over, he said, well, my son is back in the church. He goes, what happened? He goes, I'll tell you what happened. I heard that this Deacon Harold guy was supposed to be speaking someplace, so I wrote a check and paid my son to go see him. You know what I'm saying? Not the admission fee to the conference. He wrote a check and paid his son. Now, I didn't know any of this. No one talked to me afterward, nothing. He goes, I don't know what that deacon said, but my son is back in the church. My grandkids are baptized. He's involved in the men's group. How does that happen? Again, father couldn't do it, so God brought me into this person's life. And guess what? God wants to use you exactly the same way. There's nothing special about me. I'm some immigrant kid that grew up with a, in a single family home. <laughs> I should be dead or in jail. But instead, because as the old spiritual says, I decided to make Jesus my choice. I saw the love and the sacrifice of my mother. There were other men in my life besides my father that showed me how to be powerful witnesses to God's love and God's truth that I am the person who I am today. So have, pray that God brings someone else into your children's life besides you, and I end with this. How powerful can this be in, in your own life? These are, again, these are people just writing in that have nothing to do with me, but here's what they say. Just ran into a friend of my niece who went to your parish mission at Holy Cross. She told me she dragged her 10-year-old to it even though he had no interest in going. After your two-hour talk, so I spared you, <laughs> the mom loved it, but the 10-year-old wanted to buy up all your books and CDs. His mom told me he has listened to you every night. Just wanted to give you an example of how you're changing lives. I ain't changing nothing. Remember? We're just instruments. God's the musician. Then finally, where do I begin? Thank you for saying yes for being a true voice for Christ. I was worried about my Protestant friends that I brought to the men's conference in Columbus. There were 3,000 guys there. I was worried that they would feel alienated and possibly insulted and annoyed with me. 
what happened was exactly the opposite. I just got a text from my friend who was raised Catholic, but after a family tragedy, stopped going to church. He said he never felt at home in his new church, and when he heard you, he appreciated your candor and truth. He asked me, how do I get back to the Catholic church? Can you remind me how to do reconciliation? I don't know what happened, but I believe God wants me back in the Catholic church. My other friend was never had much of a religious background. He was flipping through his Bible as you were talking about reconciliation in the Mass. He leaned into me and said, do you mind if I come with you to Easter Vigil? I want to see people take the Eucharist for the first time. Again, my friends, effective evangelization is about having the courage to witness to the power of God's love by just throwing a few seeds of faith. Huh? And so I leave you with the words the deacon leaves you with at the end of Mass. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. God bless you. Thank you so much.